Now then, welcome back to Sado Sados. For listening, usually I'm uh, joined by my co-host Alison Barton Simmons, but this week it's just me, Eggs Benedict, because she's off in Spain enjoying some early spring sunshine. The lucky girl. So I'm flying solo for this one, this special bonus episode. Although strictly speaking, I'm not flying solo because I'm joined by a, a rather special guest this week for this bonus, Will Bates, son of Ralph and uh, actor who played. Young Toby in Dear John is joining us from his home in L.A. this evening. In 1986, Will took on the TV role, obviously needed a little research, I guess, because he was the son of the lead character in, in Dear John. And as Toby Lacey, Will appeared in three episodes across two series, ricocheting between his parents' home and London Zoo following their acrimonious divorce in the show. But in real life, the success of Will's parents, Ralph and Hammer Horror actor Virginia Weatherall, wasn't enough to entice Will into a full-time career in front of the camera. With the goal of becoming a composer ever since the age of five, Will started learning violin from a very early age, moved on to saxophone and other instruments, and since then has progressed through techno, electric, jazz, indie genres, singer-songwriter before putting together a production company, scoring films, TV and commercials, as well as writing for other artists. So rather than dragging Will off to the zoo for the umpteenth time, we met up with Toby at McDonald's. Not really. (laughs) <laughs> for a chat about Dear John <laughs> and, and his award-winning career in music, as well as um, this upcoming work on the Rihanna documentary, I believe, Will. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. How accurate was that blurb? Was it a load of bollocks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. Pretty accurate. Yeah, I think you got it all in there. Yeah, it was a bit wordy, but there we go. We got there. So first question for you, Will. Yeah. Captain Kirk is climbing a mountain. Why is he climbing a mountain? <laughs> oh, because he's in love. That one, I mean, that, I, I feel like that little video is sort of what changed my, the course of my career. It was all done as a bit of a joke and then it kind of launched Fall On Your Sword as a, as a band and then I turned it into a company because I found myself starting a band in order to play that song at like sci-fi conventions and stuff. It was, oh, right, okay. it was really kind of bonkers. Yeah, it was um, a bit of an unexpected hit. So, yeah. There is a passionate affair going on between Kirk and the mountain. Kirk is on the Kirk is on the mountain. Now, in order to create that illusion, sucking some of the most sensational men who not only climb are voracious, fleeting, and elusive and peripheral, and that's putting me on the mountain. Captain Kirk is climbing a mountain. Why is he climbing a mountain? Captain Kirk is climbing a mountain. Why is he climbing a mountain? Captain Kirk is climbing a mountain. Why is he climbing a mountain? Captain Kirk is climbing a mountain. Hold it, please. Hug the mountain. Envelop that mountain with hug the mountain. To envelop that mountain with hug the mountain. That mountain, that mountain. He wants to make love to the mountain. And the climb is going where no man has gone before. Where no man has gone before. Yeah, God, that one gets pulled out of the closet every now and again, it seems. (laughs) (laughs) For anyone not familiar, this was what, an early YouTube? Yeah, it was like a, yeah, it was like a, a very early viral video. I mean, it would have been like 2006 or wait, no, that can't be right. 2007. Anyway. Um, yeah, it's based on a, a DVD extra that I stumbled on in Star Trek five, where William Shatner is giving an interview about his directing of that, of, of Star Trek five. And it's just this incredible hour long interview that just needed to be set to music. So I, wrote a piece of music around it and then uh the rest is history i guess it's just one of those things that i think you just have to kind of see yeah i mean we'll we'll drop the clip in but certainly do look it up on youtube and of course you you and your writing partner re-recorded it to release as an actual single didn't you 
We did, yeah. Like a year or two later, we did, yeah. I I can't tell if that was a good idea or not, but, <laughs> you know. And I quite liked it. The one tu- YouTube comment on that video of you two re-recording it, because you're dressed up as a mountain in it, aren't you? I'm dressed as the mountain. My wife made the mountain costume, which uh, she was very proud of. <laughs> and in fact, when I phone her, she has, like, me dressed as the mountain as her little, like, you know, icon for me. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> There's a, there's a comment on that video that says, there needs to be an award for the performance of the man dressed as a mountain. Oh, quite right. Well, good. Finally, my work is being appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly your acting never left you. It didn't, but that might be about the extent of it, to be honest. Um, <laughs> yeah, Dear John was, was an amazing experience and just a lovely way to spend time with my dad and whatnot. But it wasn't really a thing that I ever took particularly seriously. You know, there was like... There was quite a lot of press when the episodes came out. And I remember there was one quote that my dad made and he put it on his wall in his study and it just said, son, be a plumber. And it was basically just him (laughs) saying, and it's sort of, that has never really left me. Like, yeah, he definitely wanted me to get a so-called proper job, not, um, not end up doing what he did, which is, you know. Does a music producer count as proper job? It's still creative, isn't it? I'm not, I don't know. Like I, I wonder sometimes, like, oh, I don't know if he'd, I'm not sure if he would have gone for this either. But, um, you know, I started out as a jazz musician and then I, I feel like I've managed to make it as much of a proper job as, as is possible in my career, in my, in my game. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I make noises for a living. It's ridiculous. So you're into playing it a bit though. I think, Will, you're a pretty big deal in that world, aren't you? To be fair. I do. All right. <laughs> you're doing pretty good for yourself. It's all. Yeah. I've been, I've been lucky. Yeah. It's been a. It's been a good run thus far. So. <laughs> as, so as a kid, did you have any concept that your parents were famous? You know, because obviously your mum, Virginia uh, Weatherall, she was an actor also. So yeah, was was that something that you, at school you were aware of? And did kids sort of make a thing of it? A little bit. Yeah, especially then, like especially when Dear John came out. And right right before that, I mean, not right before, like a, what, like 10 years before that, there was Poldark and my dad. Mm. became quite well known because of that and you know as a very at a very young age I saw my parents being killed in various different ways like by the time I was seven I think I'd seen my dad thrown down a well hanged um stabbed in the face and obviously my dad killed my mum in Dr Jekyll and Sister Hyde that's how they met and fell in love so it's sort of (laughs) It, it was very normalized, you know. I'm actually yet to show any of those movies to my kids. It's like, they, you know, obviously they never got to meet their granddad, so there's going to be this sort of unveiling at some point. Right. They do know that, yeah, granddad was a vampire. That's sort of like a normal thing in my house. But um, So you were allowed yeah. to watch the watch the Hammer Horror films from quite an early age, then were you, to see the... I kind of was, yeah. I mean, they my, my parents, like, just thought that stuff was was ridiculous and silly. And I think I, I absorbed that from right at the beginning as well. I knew it wasn't real. And my mm. godfather, Jimmy Sangster, he was always around. Like my dad and he were really good mates. And my dad was just kind of always taking the piss out of him for like, you know, Jimmy, I can see the camera in that stagecoach. Is that, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So I was just like very, I was very aware that it was fantasy. But, um, but yeah, when I was, when Dear John came out, it was definitely like a thing, you know, at school. There's one thing that I, I, I was too young to remember this, but my sister remembered, like, we would go to Spain and Polduck was massive in Spain, like oh, okay. massive, way bigger than England. Right. And we'd walk into a restaurant and people would start hissing. Like they would be like, boo. Oh, would they? Because it's George Warleg and it's the baddie, you know, like, yeah. Um, you know, it was kind of, so I don't know, I, I saw a bit of that, but yeah, I mean, it's funny, like meeting people my age will like remember Dear John, but that's sort of about it really. You yeah. Know, I, like, I must admit, I think I'm about the same age as you. I was born in 77. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly the same. So pulled up was a little bit before my time. Same. Yeah. It got re-released. You might not remember that, but it got, when I was about. I must have been about 10. I think it got re-released in England. Um, it was on like BBC Two. You know what I mean? It was kind of like a little, they like redid it for a second. Mm. But yeah, I, it didn't have the same sort of impact as it did when it first came out. 
No, yeah. I think I'm more familiar with with your dad's work, obviously, dear John. But then also, he he cropped up in Minder, didn't he, and things like That's that. That's right. And, yeah, yeah. I know. What was the other one I saw? Uh, there was an episode of Tales of the Unexpected. He was in. Yep, that's, that's a good one. Really enjoy. It. He got blinded in that one, didn't he? Did you see that I one as a think kid? He that must have been did. scary. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that's a good good memory. Yeah, then there's that one. He does one with Julian Fellows, I think, in that as well. They were kind of good mates too. Yeah, I feel like all those shows were like a lot of the same kind of Hammer hammer Horror alumni that did all of those too. Mm. Yeah, does that feel to, to some of the... To some of the uh... Sorry, I've forgotten the name of the show I was just talking about. What was it called? <laughs> Tales of the Unexpected. Tales of the Unexpected, yeah. There is that yeah. sort of a very dark undercurrent to a lot of those stories isn't it totally yeah it's good stuff your sister's daisy Bates. she's also an, a- an actor isn't she so do you think being a creative is in the blood given all four of you <laughs> yeah i suppose it is yeah definitely i mean i think that i always it's funny i i, I was quite conflicted when i when I left school, I thought like, oh, I, I should probably do what my dad said and get a proper job. And like people at people at my school were kind of trying to encourage me to not necessarily go into music, which now I'm like, you assholes, really? You mm. made me waste all that time. So I ended up getting a, going to do a French degree, which is really ridiculous. And then I lasted for like a year doing that and realized like, I I remember calling my mum up like outside King's College in London and being like, mum, I think I think I've made a terrible choice here. I think I'm going to go and do a a music degree. And she was like, and you know, she's an amazing mother and was just like, you do whatever makes you happy. So um, she never really, she wanted me to just sort of make my own choices, I think. And I realized that the more sensible thing was to go and do something that I would really commit myself to, which is, mm. which is composing. So, um, so I did that, but yeah, I, I do think it's, you know, it was a very creative childhood and, you know, my, it's funny now, you know, the next generation I'm, I'm married to a painter. My wife is also incredibly creative. Oh, right. My kids don't have a chance, you know? So we're yeah. all, I'm, I'm, I find myself like joking. My kid, my son is seven. My daughter's five. I'm like, you know, you should be an accountant. Like, oh my God, I'm like doing the same thing that my old man did. What's going on? Yeah, I and mean, that's it. As a parent, you can you can only really just say what try things and whatever whatever makes you happy. You might be yeah. able to make a make a dollar bill from it. Yeah, exactly. And I I think my dad would have like really. He probably would have pushed me to to do the right thing and and do the music thing. Honestly, just mm. uh. With him not being around, I think I kind of questioned every decision a bit too much when I was a teenager. So, mm. so I've got. I might as well ask this, since as I, I touched on that Captain Kirk thing. Do you think you'll ever return to the Scratch Records one day? I know you do a lot more serious stuff around film and TV and and, um, and stuff like that these days, but I can see the the need for a quality. Keep my wife's name out of your fucking mouth. Mix up <laughs> right. on YouTube one of these days, you know. <laughs> yeah, man. It's funny. I I'm actually making a record right now with my drummer Spencer Cohen, who was kind of like part of that band. When I mean, I haven't done that stuff for like ten years, you know. Yeah. Um, but he was in town. We were working on this album, which is like another project. And he, every time we're together, he's always like, "All right, so I got this. This is how we could do it." moving forward we'll just do it on a laptop you don't have to get all analog and do all your weird samples and all that stuff so he's like really pushing me to do it and i'm definitely like the itch is getting a bit extreme so i i do think that um i probably will there's another side of what i do which is this fall on your sword we we make these art installations i'm not sure if you've seen yeah i was going to ask you about that yeah yeah so that in a way kind of like replaced the need to go out on stage or like travel around in the back of the van going to a venue you know what I mean like doing the art shows it sort of took the same took that same space in my mind so we just did a show uh last month called Neil Before Dog that was uh this sort of altarpiece that you kind of when you're not standing on it it's like loads of people cooking and then when you stand on it everyone starts eating and then you kneel on it like you're praying and everyone starts kind of drinking and cheersing and celebrating and stuff um okay. we it, it was for this show that's sort of about heresy um but anyway like we do these like quite public 
performances and like get people to kind of experience these pieces so i feel like somehow it's like a a hybrid of the band in a way doing that stuff it's interesting isn't it you i don't know if you feel the same way i'm I'm not a creative on anything like the level that you are but i'm an amateur musician and obviously i'm a podcaster and um, i've done some daft little video skits for the internet and things and i always find that if i'm doing anything that's too serious because i'm naturally sort of quite a silly person I have to go and do something that's just a bit daft and sort of let off steam in a in a yeah. much more in much more trivial and kind totally. of totally silly like, way that's kind of more honest and yeah I mean yeah some of what I do is is quite you know the day job is is brilliant it's amazing but sometimes can be quite kind of intense and doing this stuff that's just for fun is is a good release that's for sure so just tell me a little bit about about fall on your sword then because like you say you perform as a live band sporadically you have the art installations one of the main things i I noticed from looking through the biography and everything is is the work you've done on sci-fi type movies with mike kale Mm -hmm. so yeah i've seen i've seen a few of his movies i'm quite i'm quite a fan of his work um Mm. i saw bliss when it came out on netflix oh good yeah so i went back and rewatched bliss after i realized that you were the sort of person behind the soundscape of that and I was, it's it's weird, isn't it? In film music, like the great unwashed like me, a lot of the time we don't notice it so much unless it's not there. <laughs> right. The jo- job is almost just to, to move the story on. Sure. Or if it's, or if it's really bad. Yeah. Oh, yes. And it's really <laughs> jarring. Yeah, that can be true. But uh, what I noticed on the rewatch was just how wonderfully well you were uh, blending the two different worlds that existed in that movie and they both had their own sort of soundscapes and idiosyncrasies. And that's right. Exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. It was kind of, there was a whole the idea of like threading the two worlds with melody. So there's like melody that lives in both, but each world has its own sort of collection of instruments and, you know, soundscape. It's quite, quite ethereal, wasn't it? In the, um, yeah, a lot of the it drug adult world. Yeah, totally. Exactly. And then there was a, I wrote a song for, um, my dear friend, Sky Edwards from more Chiba. So there's that, that roller skating scene that, um, we ended up, Amazon were into putting it out for a single. So we like turned it into a, a record and did a whole right. thing with it, which is really fun. And weirdly, I think I've managed to do that with most of Mike's films, and Mike is kind of the reason that I got into doing television. He, uh, scoring television after I origins, he, um, ended up doing the pilot for a show called the magicians and that ended up running for five seasons. And that was sort of the reason I moved to LA. I was living in New York for 15 years, um, right. doing a lot of like indie films and documentaries for Alex Gibney and like really, really good stuff. But I was having a hard time kind of breaking into the TV landscape it's kind of like a bit of a different set of people yeah and uh and he did the magicians and then it just like one show just kind of led to another he and and then he did another one called the path and then another one called night flyers another one called rise and i just did them all with him and that's kind of how i have a lot to thank that man for basically is there is there a big difference between doing stuff for tv and and doing standalone movie yeah, I I think in the end it's sort of um I mean the the beginning the that very first part of the process where you're coming up with themes for characters and you got to find the thing that one melody or one chord sequence couldn't live without the other in terms of a character or whatnot. That mm. that part of the process is the same, but I think the the sort of nitty gritty part of it, the amount of work that you have to do, it's like a freight train, you know, it just kind of it will just keep coming you'll finish an episode and be like oh shit i've got to do another one in like <laughs> five days <laughs> pays the bills i guess but no it's great i mean i i i love that i work very quickly and i i i love pressure when i was at school i was always the guy that did the homework the night before you know it's sort of just right. it's it's been normal for me to have that kind of mad deadline dash and i i kind of came up scoring commercials that's how i sort of learned my craft and and to do that stuff you have to be super fast and i feel like doing television is like a hybrid of like the speed of doing commercials with the sort of artistry of scoring a movie so it was kind of a nice blend of the disciplines i guess right so do you, do you feel like you sort of rammed 
Chivali moment is is coming, or maybe it's already been, and with a certain track, you know, the, the way that the Game of Thrones theme is like catapulted him to beyond just the people who like film music. Right, totally. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure that I'm I've quite done a show at that level, to be totally honest. But yeah, there's a couple of things on the horizon that are looking that are pretty good i'm on a show right now called the devil in ohio and uh, right. i've been writing a couple of songs for that as well as the score which has been really fun so you never know right yeah <laughs> it's it's kind of i always think life is very much about being in the right place at the right time sometimes yeah definitely i mean getting the gig for 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 that game of thrones thing catapulted his work more into the into the mainstream public consciousness but the theme he wrote for for westworld was out of this out of this world wasn't it i mean yeah it's great yeah, he's fantastic. If you could have scored any film in the past, what would it have been? Have you ever thought about, oh, like I'd love to have done that differently? Um, I think, I mean, there are things that I'd love to do. I'd love to, I'd love to do a Bond movie. I just, I have like a, I love John Barry. I just think he's brilliant. And I feel like a lot of the, I, I love the idea of inhabiting a, a world that already exists like that. Like he come like doing a gig like that just comes with its own vocabulary that would be so fun to to play yeah. with. Um, yeah, and like I don't know, like a I I don't know, like I'd love to do a like a superhero thing or something like that. Whatever, I'm just happy to be working. <laughs> to be honest, yeah. <laughs> so. I, I guess that the fact that you've done all this sci-fi stuff is mainly due to your relationship with Mike, um, rather than a particular um, hankering after that genre of of TV and film stuff. You, I mean, it, you do cover a breadth of other works, don't you, in your in your portfolio? Yeah, there's lots of there's a lot of docs, a lot of documentaries, a lot of stuff about cults, which I think is just a coincidence. But right. um, but that's a thing. That's definitely true. Um, yeah, and like you know, working for for Gibney sort of opened various other doors. They did a show called The Looming Tower a while ago that was, um, you know, obviously about the build up to nine eleven. And um, oh yeah, I saw that. I saw a couple of episodes of that, and then I just drifted off. There you go. I should go back and check that out. Yeah, I hope it wasn't the score. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Do you have Jeff Daniels in? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah Jeff yeah. Daniels. Yeah, that's yeah. A good I should one. go back and carry on watching that. What else? Anyway, whatever. Lots of bits and bobs but yeah i mean you know all the the sci-fi stuff and the various sort of horror things i guess kind of all the seed for a lot of those projects kind of begins with yeah the cahill projects so the rihanna documentary that you're coming up has that um has that been affected like post pandemic or i i've got to be completely honest i don't know what's going on with that i um, oh, right. <laughs> yeah i i finished that like two years ago Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just weird. on the shelf somewhere. Yeah. They bought it. And then um, I think at this point, it's probably okay to be talking about it. It's Peter Berg directed that one. Um, yeah. And I, Amazon bought it. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's ever going to come out. It's very strange. But have you ever seen like film director Kevin Smith talking about when he went to make a film with Prince? No. Wow. Um, and, and Prince got him in and they did all the shooting. And obviously Prince was, was an odd guy. And he had shoot this, shoot this, shoot this. And then he wouldn't see him for hours. And then he didn't know what was going on. And he spent all this time with Prince. And then he just ended up on a shelf in Prince's archive somewhere. Really? Like, wow. like so much of his music, in fact. Of course. Yeah. Well, hopefully we get to see it one day. Yeah. Hopefully that doesn't happen with your Rihanna work. Because that would we'll be a waste. See. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it would be a waste, but you never know. <laughs> we'll see. Watch this space. It's, it's out of your control, I guess. It is a bit, yeah. So on your website, there's um on on the um, fall on your sword website, there's a there's a line there that just says we have a bar. Oh yeah. What does that mean? Is that literal? <laughs> it's literal. Yeah, we have a bar. We um we're we're very proud of the the space. So it's m my business partners are. A lady called Lucy Alper and we uh we sort of started the whole thing back in New York and uh we built studios in New York and we ended up leaving New York about 10 years ago and kind of what, what am I talking about six years ago and moved the whole thing out to LA and when we when we kind of remodeled the building here we 
one of the first things that I was like, we have to have a bar in the back. Right. And we built the most amazing bar. My wife did the, built the whole thing around it. It's really beautiful. And, you know, we have a bar. We're very proud of it. Open to the public or just for you guys? Not really. No, but you never know. I mean, you know, next time you're in town, <laughs> it's open for you. Brilliant. I'll tell Al. Um, yeah, but we are, you know, we, we've, Lately, we've been doing a lot more kind of post-production as well. Like we're not just um, a music company. We have like a 7.1 mix facility. And so we have a lot of clients coming in and out of the building all the time. So they like the fact that we have a bar and all the art pieces are also kind of on display. The whole place is kind of like a bit of a playground, honestly. Yeah. And some of the photos of, of that space do look amazing on the website. I also I dug out a couple of old interviews that you did some of them going back sort of 10 or 12 years. And I picked up on a little snippet that you worked with Paul McCartney as a saxophonist at one point. <laughs> yeah, I did. I mean, yeah, it was on Lulu's game show. Oh, I, um, right. there was this, yeah. So it's a bit of a stretch, but it was basically, he was a guest and I had like two days being in his band, which was just, I mean, it was amazing, mm. you know, basically me and my mate Quentin were with a horn section for his band for, a, for a weekend, which was like kind of unbelievable. But yeah, Lulu had this show called Red Alert. It was like 1998, probably 99. And it was like connected with the national lottery. Okay. Um, I don't remember that at all. Does this ring a bell? No. Yeah. It was, it, and there was like Mark Almond was on it and Paul and who else? Various other guests. Um, and it was actually, it was filmed in Bray, which is back in the day, it was like the Hammer Horror, one of the Hammer Horror kind of film studios. And my parents had worked there a lot. So it was like, whoa, this is mm. weird. We're all at Bray. And, you know, my mum had all these stories about that place. Yeah. Yeah. But that was that was the extent. Yeah, I was I was playing sax with him. It's a claim to fame, though, isn't it? Really, I guess. To, oh to... yeah, hanging out with Paul? You kidding? Of course. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I can't stand Paul McCartney. <laughs> I'll cut that bit out. Really? He's just one of those guys. You just you know, like some people's, whether it's their face or just their embarrassing sort of, you know, kind of peace and love. Yeah, sure. I mean, we just finished watching Get Back. Have you seen that yet? Yeah, it's an the... interesting little sort of snapshot, isn't it? It is. And it's really interesting for for him, you know, for me to sort of like really see the context of what he was really like back then. It's really interesting. Yeah. He really kind of, he really steered that ship, didn't oh, he? Oh, completely. Like you really get a sense of... Nobody would have got anything done if it wasn't for him, would they? That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we saw him perform at Dodger Stadium last year. Maybe it was the year before. And it was... It was amazing. Like the one man wrote all that stuff. Mm. It's crazy. He's been pr very prolific, hasn't he? And to still be going now in his 80s is, you know, touring the yeah, world is pretty impressive. It's bananas. Challenge the rock. Challenging death. Why do I climb the mountain? Because I'm in love. So um, were you a fan of Hammer Horror yourself? Having watched it at a young age, is it something you go back to and look at, even for the nostalgia of seeing your mum and dad? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I feel like it's so it's so kind of intrinsically connected to yeah. me. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know if you can see in the back of my studio. Oh, of that course, right I didn't even clock it. Yeah. Taste the Blood of Dracula poster. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's just like, it's family to me, that stuff. So... Do I like it? It's kind of hard to really say. I'm not like, I don't like seek out Hammer movies to watch or anything like that, but I'm very fond of it. The ones with the familial connection is, is more of an appeal, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and Cushing and, and Christopher Lee and stuff. I, of course, like that stuff's just like classic. And it seems like there are just a lot of like really amazing actors just having a lot of fun is what it seems like yes, to me yeah. it seems like that's what hammer really was it's a bit of a playground yeah i know what you mean by that they do look like they're having a whale of a time a lot of the time on those productions right and they're like these are like serious shakespearean like badasses and they're just like kuna rush and them just like giggling between <laughs> takes you know what about Dear John then, just to, to bring it back to, because um, a lot of our listeners are yeah, sure. sort of Dear John and sitcom fans predominantly. 
do you, is that something that you could sort of rewatched over the years? Is it or do you own the box set, for example, the, the DVDs? Um, I I don't have it in LA. I do. My mum has it. I have to be honest. Like I um, I feel like I'm pretty balanced and even keeled about the death of my dad, and I'm mm. like I have a pretty normal healthy relationship if that makes sense i feel like i grieved in a good way one thing that will the thing that is my kryptonite is actually that episode that you're talking about you know about. We, we we discussed it we wondered whether there was a particular scene in that and we thought that must be difficult for him to look oh, it's it's hard yeah. yeah i i watched that my rehearsal dinner when um when i got married so what's that like 12 years ago my my brother-in-law made like this sort of compilation and it was so moving and it was really beautiful but it just like it killed me and it like ended with the you know that like freeze frame of like the two of us yeah and it's you know i i mean it's so amazing to have had that experience and i i think the reason that it's it's so i find it so emotional is like that was that was sort of the first and only like like father son time that I had right that makes sense like I, I was just so little I was I was very young and I was you know he died when I was 13 so that was sort of like the f- the first time that we were like doing a thing together and it was like our thing and it was you know and it wasn't you know we did it it was only like a few days here and there but it was really special to me and really important I bet, and, yeah. and I think that that's kind of really connected to watching it so yeah I you know I'll watch it with my kids one day of course and it's it's easier for me to watch the first one, the zoo one, because that one's so silly, and I'm so little in that one. Yes, yeah. but that but the Toby one is like, oh god, that's like, yeah, yeah, that's that that shit cuts the bone, man. But you know, it's good. It's, I, I mean, that was the beauty of John Sullivan's writing as well, is he could do brilliant drama in amongst all the comedy. Oh, exactly. That's right. Exactly. That's his genius. And you know, John was also really involved. In our lives, John was there the was night he? my dad died. Oh, yeah. Like he was there with my mum. He walked into the house and it was like he's gone. But and we all like you know sobbed together. And you know John was such a massive. There were such good mates, the two of them. Um, and like the the two couple, John and Sharon, and my mum and dad would like go on trips together and stuff. And they were they were really tight. So did they know each other before the Dear John project came along? Then I'm assuming, or not not really. I feel like he, uh, my mum would know have a better answer for this story. But I'm pretty sure that the character was kind of written with my dad in mind, and I think it was because of, right. I think it was because of Second Chance which is another TV show. That rings a bell. I might be I might be completely getting that wrong, but I'm pretty sure that it was second chance and and Sullivan was a fan and was sort of like I need I want that guy. Right. God, he was funny though. Sullivan was just he was so warm and so just so such a sweet guy but just so fucking funny. Like yeah. Um, like just he is Del Boy and he is like <laughs> John Lacey and he's all those people he's Trigger you know he's everyone he's all those characters just all lived inside him you know yeah I mean he's he was an incredible body of work that he's left behind speaks for itself really doesn't it but to have known him and to have had him as part of the family must have been kind of amazing it was yeah it's very special so I'm guessing that your casting as Toby wasn't an it wasn't a rigorous kind of audition it, process it wasn't. given that you're the son of the lead. I know? mean talk of talking about like right place, right time as well. That was like I think I was just sometimes my, my dad didn't know like my mum so my mum worked at a, she had her own antique shop. So she kinda like gave up acting and yep. had this antique shop that ended up being quite successful in, in Notting Hill Gate. She had it for forty two years. So my mum would always, you know, she'd be busy with the shop and I think my sister was probably at school and my dad was probably like, shit, I have to go to, a, I have to do a script reading or whatever at television center. You got to come with me. And I'd, I'd end up going to television center quite a lot. You know, that place in, in White City that's now a Soho house, I think. Right. Which is ridiculous. But um, Just make sure you don't bump into Jimmy Savile in the corridor and you're fine. Yeah. Oh man, I was on the bloody beanbags as a kid in the Jim Will Fix It show. Were you? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. He never picked me. I 
picture. Uh, yeesh. Yeah, I think we all wrote a letter and, and they're now glad it never got picked out of the bag. Yeah, no kidding. God, man, that's, yeah, that's all scary and scary and heartbreaking. But um, anyway, the television centre was kind of quite an amazing place. You know, you'd go to like the Blue Peter Garden on the roof and stuff like that. It was kind of fun. But yeah, I went to a, a reading with the director, Ray Butt was there and he literally just like threw the script at me and was like can you read this part and i'm like okay yeah do you want to do it all right great <laughs> it's all easy right. as that it, it was i mean it was like four lines or something wasn't it or maybe a bit more in the in that first episode the first one yeah but yeah that was that was sort of it that just kind of sort of did it my dad told me like you know don't over pretend he kind of like coached me through it obviously yeah yeah and that was that was it and then I, I after after the second season there were a couple of other I ended up getting an agent it was his agent and he was kind of like do you want to do that again and I was like nah, all right okay so I did two auditions and the first one was for this like French guy. Don't know who it was. I wish I did because it might have been someone quite well known. But the guy didn't speak any English, and for some reason they thought I spoke French. Right. So in the audition, they realised that I didn't, and it, that was pointless. So that didn't go well. Sat the agent. I don't care if he is dad's agent. <laughs> yeah. No. No shit. And then the next one was for a bubblegum commercial, and it was just horrible. They. I had to like sing my name on my left foot my address on my right foot and like dance and stuff and it was just like that's not it's not my thing do you know what I mean yeah so um so I I remember walking out of that audition and, and I was like dad I hated that he's like okay we don't we don't have to do that again done and that was the end of it and we, then I, he's like do you want to what do you want to do I want to I want to learn the saxophone all right so he went off and bought me a saxophone and that was that was that brilliant but yeah when we when we were sort of deep diving because that's what we do on the show we we deep dive episode by episode sure every every single one of of the sitcoms that we look at each each series of our podcast is on a different sitcom and each episode is on a particular episode of that sitcom i love it that's great and as we were going through we both agreed that sort of the acting that you were given even as an amateur was, was very naturalistic so I guess that came from working alongside your dad and just I being familiar. So. It wasn't a stranger. That's right. And, you know, there's something to, I think, being in that situation. And the people that I was around with were kind of like my family, you know, Ray Butt, Sue Bish, Peter Blake, like all of these people, I, they just sort of were people that I knew hanging out at our house. And yeah, I remember Adrian Pegg, who's this lovely, I think he must have been like the production manager or something, but just really... There was a really tight crew. And then, of course, yeah, my dad. And I think when you're a kid, you, I had, I wasn't, wasn't even a teenager yet. You know what I mean? I still had that sort of like, everything was, there was no dividing line between what was real and what wasn't real. It was all just kind mm. of it. It was just natural. And you see that with like certain kid actors, don't you, where it just feels normal. Well, we were discussing that as well, how, how some kids aren't, some kid actors aren't very convincing, even as kids, even though that's what they are. So that's why we were quite impressed with with, with the Toby work that you did. Because oh, right it was on. just Thank you. it was just quite natural. <laughs> yeah. I mean that's definitely to do with my dad as well, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. I it's like occasionally occurred to me that maybe I don't know, I could have pursued it a bit more, but I'm I'm glad in a way that I didn't. Have you never um, considered asking some of the uh asking to have cameo roles in some of these wonderful projects that you've been involved in? No. <laughs> not something not something you'd ever want to do. No, it's hard enough getting the gig as a composer, trying to like shoehorn my way into that stuff. No way. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> you know where you want to be. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy with this spot. It's good. Well, that big penguin, he must be new. He was here last week. Was he? And the week before. Really? He's here every week. The first time you saw me was an egg. So <laughs> you may not know the answer to this, Will, but we noticed that after the second series of Dear John, the entire cast, including your dad, went and did an Alan Akebourne play and they all toured around. I think it was called Absent Friends. That's right, Absent Friends. 
So we presume that sort of being willing to all tour together, not all of them, I don't think Belinda Lang was on it and maybe some well, one other person was absent, but it was pretty much the central Dear John cast. So we presume they were a fairly tight bunch if they were happy to tour and work together in that De- way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they were they were all good mates. Was I feel like was Peter Blake on that tour? Maybe he wasn't. Maybe yeah, he, yeah, yeah, he, he was. was. Peter Blake, Peter Denyer, Rachel Bell. Oh, Peter Denyer. Yeah. Yeah. Nice bunch. Really lovely bunch. I mean, like like I said, like that lot were just kind of, they were just family. Mm. Was Peter Blake as charismatic as he always seems in every role he was ever in, in yes. real life? Yeah, he was ridiculous. He looks like such a fun-loving guy. Oh, and, man. And not just as Kirk, but just, you know, he whenever was, you see him. Especially as a kid. I mean, I, I think I was like a bit starry-eyed around peter like or blakey as he was called in our house not to be confused with blakey from under Moses. <laughs> yeah no kidding i never made that connection actually um yeah he was just just noisy and fun and and ridiculous i went through a very short phase i've never told anyone this of um of doing graffiti i think i was 11 and i my tag was right. sod s-o-d and me and my mate right. Gavin would like go down the subway and like we were rubbish. We would just sort of like we'd do sod and a little <laughs> thing and then like somewhere else. And I remember Peter Blake busted me doing it. And it was like if anyone was gonna bust me like doing graffiti in the subway tunnel, I'm glad that it was Blakey. It was <laughs> sort of like any I'm not gonna tell your dad or your mum, but for fuck's sake, Wills, what are you doing? It's just like a <laughs> That's pretty good of him not to tell them. Exactly. Just to give yeah. you a slap I, on the wrist. I assume that he never did, but yeah. Anyway. Well, that's the kind of guy he is. Yeah, nice. Kurt would have said. There you go. Good one. <laughs> I mean, I guess, like I say, we don't really expect you to remember much, but any any sort of anecdotes or memories that you do have, just, you know, feel free just to... Sure. Well, I, I was thinking about this. I mean, being on the set, I, I mean, I remember for the first season, like we would... It was just like a, it was just like everyone was having fun all the time. And I kind of, that was one part of it where I was like, maybe I do want to do this when I grow up because they wouldn't like just break for lunch. They would set up cricket stumps in the middle of the street and we'd like play cricket for two hours. You know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff. And then just sort of, you'd be friends with the entire neighborhood on the street. I remember the kid next door to where Wendy and Toby live the little boy that lived next door had one of those cars that you, I would, I remember seeing them in like Selfridges, you know, like kid sized cars. And I, him, him and I ended up like driving around the neighborhood in them. I kind of couldn't right. believe that I met someone that had one of those things. Um, so there was just this like magical atmosphere that was so incredible for a kid. And one thing that I do remember as well was we, um, my mum and dad, would host the sort of rap party, which ended up becoming the kind of BBC light entertainment Christmas party. And oh, it was, wow. It was in our house. And I don't know why, but I I remember not, I'm like, I won't go to bed until I break dance in front of everyone. And, and my mum and dad were like, all right, fine. So I remember the entire, like, the cream of, like, British comedy was sort of assembled in in our sitting room and i wow. crank up huey lewis the power of love and <laughs> great tune <laughs> i mean you know it was it was of the time and um just like threw my body around the floor for three minutes and then went to bed and it was just like a it's just sort of like a weird fever dream I'm like really that's that's something that really happened was bruce forsyth there nodding his head in approval at your dance moves no i mean probably yeah <laughs> yeah crazy Anyway, that's it. <laughs> that's very magnanimous of them to ho- to host the uh, the light entertainment Christmas party at your house, though, eh? Yeah, it was it was kind of great. It's uh, yeah, crazy. <laughs> so, I, I guess you you may or may not know the answer to this, but was was Dear John something that your dad was particularly proud of, coming as it did sort of towards the end of his career and his life, and being quite different from the things that preceded it. Was it was it something that he held in sort of really high regard and he was very fond of, glad that he'd done? Yeah, he really definitely, he really did. And he had a he had a certain kind of hero worship of comedians. I remember 
something that he used to tell me was the the two bravest professions are stand up comedians and and boxers. He's also a, a big boxing fan. Um, and I think doing comedy in that way, like I think he probably would have pursued it more. Mm. Um, and of course, you know, he was doing Run for Your Wife like three weeks before he died. I don't know if you know that that play, the Ray Cooney. Yeah, I didn't know that. No. I mean, I'm, we're very familiar with the play because it keeps cropping up on Does the, it? Um, I'm sure, yeah. It's all the same. It's all that same crowd. In fact, Peter yeah. Peter Blake and my dad were... My dad played John Smith and Peter played uh, Sergeant Troutman. And that was like another, like, Saturday afternoon. My dad would do a matinee and I'd have to, like... T- I saw that play at least... A, definitely over a hundred times i mean i he i just sit in the royal box because it would always be empty for the matinee right and i you know hanging out with lionel jeffries and windsor davis and roy hud and you know it's mad that it's, it's crazy mad back on yeah it. all of these like huge stars that of that era that all ended up doing that play it's really bananas and richard Bryars did that play with um, yeah he did with bernie cribbins didn't he that's right yep um, That's right. And Richard Bryce is obviously another one of our favourites. From the good, good life. life. Yeah, he's, in, in he's wonderful. Series. Yeah, good dude. Alison unearthed that your middle name uh, was rather unusual. Mm-hmm. And and looking deeper into that, she sort of worked out that both yourself and obviously by connection your dad are descendants of Louis Pasteur on your mother's yep. side. On my dad's side, yeah. On, on his I'm sorry, on his, his mother's, mother's side. side. That's right, yeah. That's a bizarre little. Um, it certainly is another another claim to fame for you, isn't it? Impressive. It it's sort of too unbelievable to be real. My um my father in law is a orthopedic surgeon, right. and when I first met them in England, they're from Michigan, um, and we met. My wife and I met twenty years ago in front of a pub in Carnaby Street, and you know she was going to marry like the kind of heir to the company in Michigan, but she ran away with me instead. So I, I already on paper didn't look good. Yeah. So I did everything to try and like, you know, tear my way back into, into their favor. And that was one of the things. And he didn't, I realized years later that he didn't believe me at the time, because I think about five or six years after we, we got married, he was like, you really are, you really are Louis Pasteur's <laughs> great, great. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's my great, great, great grand uncle, I guess. Um, so, so, so he'd been laboring under the misapprehension that you were just trying to imp- impress him with this, with a bullshit exactly. story. I guess he must have got that a lot. So almost yeah. a Kirk St. Moritz story. It seems very Kirk-like, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Crazy. And I think in a way, like my, my dad came from quite a, quite a serious medical family and you know his father was a brain surgeon his his mom was a a psychiatrist in like prisons and stuff she was kind of a she was a real pioneer in her field and her father right. was a was a surgeon so i i think there was this notion that my dad was gonna be a doctor you know yeah um so that also might be the, the plumber thing a little bit in there you know well-meaning parents and grandparents even when I was a kid, we're like, well, what's he going to be? As if that defines right. you. It doesn't define you. It's just something that you do 40 hours a week. Exactly. It? Yeah. It shouldn't just be the preoccupation, I guess. But um, yeah, you know, I think my dad just, he, to be honest, kind of died of worry because he was just completely paranoid of when the next job was going to land. And, you know, he was a real worrier. Yeah. He He was always about to quit the business and just do something completely different. It was kind of like a running gag in our family, even though he loved what he did so much. I think it was just kind of crippling this like sense of the unknown. And I think that he, that that's the part that he didn't wish upon me or my sister, you know, the kind of the uncertainty mm. of the career, but you know, it comes with a payoff and that is, that it's, it's a lot of fun, isn't it? So <laughs> that's the life of a job in actor, I guess. And I guess that those, experiences you had on dear john where you, where you were thinking oh maybe i could do this that's just uh like a a false dichotomy of what it really is right because every now and again you might find yourself in a, an environment which is supportive and full of people you love but then six weeks later you're on to the next gig or you're trying to find the next yeah, gig exactly so it, it is a hard life it eh? is yeah there's a lot of time as a kid in the in the doll queue you know it was a lot of like highs and lows 
Yeah. It was just sort of part of it. And in a way, I'm grateful having had that childhood because I feel like my life is a little bit like that as well. Like there's kind of feast or famine a bit and it's mm. it's fine. It's just kind of normal. <laughs> kind of used to it. Yeah. Do you still like sitcoms? Are you still a fan of sitcoms and what's your favourite modern or classic? Um, I mean, it's. I feel like the, the genre has like transformed, hasn't it? But um, I mean, I love, I was just watching Curb Your Enthusiasm. I'm a huge Larry David fan. I love all of the yeah. Seinfelds and stuff like that, the American stuff. But I did, I introduced someone to, it's funny, you were just talking about 40 Towers. There's an American friend of mine who'd never heard of it. And I sat and watched like three episodes with him the other day. And it's just like, oh my God. Not that, I mean, it's amazing. There's like nothing before or since that's been made like that with that. It's like watching a farce, like watching theatre, watching that stuff. Mm. And you kind of know it's, it's... It's precision engineered, isn't it? It is. Every, every just, last laugh has been yeah, crafted. It really has. Their timing, it's just like, yeah, it's 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 perfection. So I don't know. That stuff is really special to me. And I also just w- rewatched The Young Ones, which I haven't watched since I was a kid. Oh, brilliant. So good. And it's so it, abstract. Some of it is so out there. Um, yeah, and surreal. So I surreal. mean, it's one show we'll never deep dive because what can you say about these anarchic scenes really i mean there's it's it's less plot driven so much as just anarchy just yeah chaos, let's just it? do this with 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 cameras yeah it's brilliant it's so good and that, yeah i don't know if you could make a show like that anymore um no so yeah i don't know i there's so much good tv isn't there right now it's just it's kind of a true we're spoiled for choice aren't we we are a bit i don't know where your friend had been living though if he'd never heard of vaulty towers that's crazy right? americans love it don't they they do. They love it. And I always thought he was a bit of an Anglophile, but clearly not. So, Oh, well. I'm sure there are other things you can introduce him to. Maybe Dear John down the line. There you go. <laughs> so um, just before I let you go, Will, um, will you tell us a little bit about the Ralph Bates Pancreatic Cancer Research Fund, which I think your mum set up initially, did she, or was involved in? Yeah, she set it up because when my dad was ill, and this is like 19, 1991 when he was diagnosed, and he... Uh, She just couldn't believe how little knowledge there was at that time about this disease and how final it it was. And, you know, he was diagnosed with very late stage pancreatic cancer. But um, she wanted to try and do something to bring more, you know, more of a focus, more knowledge to the to the disease and and more of a understanding of what it can do and how to prevent it. And, yeah, she's set up a um, there's a a lab that's in St. George's hospital and there's some people on staff that are basically working to, to try and treat the disease. And they've been pretty successful with some of the things that they've achieved. And I think that there's a website that you can go to, to kind of figure out that. There is. I think if you just Google Ralph Bates PCR fund, you'll, you'll get there. Um, I don't know the exact address. I have been on that website because I did notice that one of the patrons is, is a guy called, Peter Blake. And I thought, that's weird. Yeah, it's the artist Peter Blake, who's also a mate. Yeah, who, um, talking of Paul McCartney, he's the guy that made the Sgt. Pepper album cover back in the day. Ah, that Peter Blake. Okay. Yeah. There's another famous Peter Blake from New Zealand as well. Oh, really? A Sir Peter Blake from New Zealand. And, and the artist is Sir Peter Blake. Oh, funny. That's bonkers. Bizarre. I mean, I suppose it's quite a common name. So that's kind of a good story. I was in a, I was, six years old in a hamburger restaurant in Chiswick with my dad and I was just drawing on a napkin and he was like draw a picture of that bloke over there who that guy over there with the beard with the white beard go on and I'm like all right so I drew this little thing on the napkin and I and he's like now go and give it to him I'm like okay so I just went over and I gave him the napkin yeah and then Peter came over and and they'd never met before but they kind of knew each other's work and they became great mates. And then Peter and my dad, turns out they were both huge boxing fans. And they right. went to the boxing matches all the time together. And that was their kind of their thing. And one of the last visitors at the hospital before my dad died was was Peter. And he just did a, a series of paintings, the alphabet series. And B was for boxer. And I remember it was raining and he he brought the the piece that he was working on, this Joe Lewis 
portrait and like showed it to my dad and had like raindrops all over it. <laughs> and then that, that piece ended up get, going to a gallery and was like shown and it had all the raindrops on it. And yeah, my, wow. he gave it to my dad in the end. But yeah, they, they were very, very, very close, him and, uh, him and Peter. He's an amazing dude. And, and on the RBPC Research Fund, is there a way you can donate money to that as well? I think it's on the website. Oh yeah, I think so. It should all be, should all be in there. Okay, well, we'll put a link to the website in the episode description so that people can find it that way as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Is there anything, I guess there isn't, and there probably isn't any need either for you, but is there anything you want to talk about or want to plug to our audience? When it comes to your work, it's kind of like you'll get paid regardless of where people watch the movie, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's true. I mean, I have a show coming out on Netflix called The Devil in Ohio. I don't know when it's coming out, so that's a bit useless, but... I'm sure it'll be some point this year and with a bit of like, there'll be a record connected to it. Um, and then I, I do have an album coming out, but it's not going to be for a little while. So is there any live performances that fall on your sword will be doing or, um, not sure about that. Yeah. I don't know. Up in the air. Maybe it? up in the air a little bit. Yeah. And I'm kind of focusing on this, on this record right now. That's my thing. So, which is more of a me, a Will Bates thing. Okay. Less of a Foy's thing. I oh, see. So it's going to be really separate to the to that label that you usually use from your studio. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It is just for just for once. It's kind of a it's a fun album. It's very sort of it's like an exotica kind of thing. Les Baxter kind of vibes. I got the theme tune to Grange Hill stuck in my head yesterday and remembered how much of a good one that is. Do you remember that as a kid? Yeah, it was amazing. It was also used on Give Us a Clue. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. They they actually used to use that before they changed to this ridiculous kind of huh. alternative theme tune. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, oh, they don't make them like that anymore. So thanks for joining us, Will. Really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Trip down memory lane. <laughs> You'll probably fall asleep and then wake up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, I've got a great anecdote. Oh, I I've got another it. one. Yeah, never mind. I'll email you. You can find out more about Will and his, check out his extensive portfolio of work on his website, fallonyoursword.com. Thank you. Thanks, Eggs. It's been great. Seems we've sung love's last song, dear John. Well, I'm sure you agree. Will is a lovely fella and hugely interesting to talk to. Very humble and, and talented man. And it was a real pleasure to catch up with him and hear all about what he's doing in the in the film and TV world. As we mentioned, the Ralph Bates Pancreatic Cancer Research Fund website is online. You can visit that at www.ralphbatespcr.org.uk. Get more information about what those guys are up to and the great work they're doing. And you can also make a donation via the website. We're hopeful that we'll be able to bring you another Dear John alumni cast interview before this series is finished too. So I guess watch this space, as they say. Hopefully it'll come off. Until then, Alison will be back with me next week for our next regular episode of the podcast, in which we're deep diving Series 2, Episode 5 of Dear John. Sadly, one that doesn't feature Will. But make sure you join us on Wednesday for that Till then, no graffitiing your local underpass with sod. <laughs> and um, and I'll see thee. <laughs>